Friday night in some part of the world and Thursday morning uh, is great to have uh, Dr. Guillermo Amesca, a very good friend, uh, a very great mentor. Guillermo, thank you for, for being here with us. Uh, thank you, Ivo and uh, Palma University for inviting me. Oh, no, it, it's an honor to have you. Also, Ishtake from Bangladesh, another very, very good friend from the house. Ishtake, welcome. It's great to have you. You, you are in mute, but okay. So um, let's start. Uh, today is a great day for us. Uh, we're launching uh, a course we have, and also we want to give you tools to learn FACO fast and efficiently. This is very important nowadays after the, everything that happened in COVID and everything we have in technology. I think it's moment to, you know, to connect the dots and use technology and use a good methodology and let young people train all over the world. We have a couple of questions and actually we're gonna share some data from a survey we did. Uh, and you know, there's a lot of people out there with the dream to become a fake surgeon and they're not allowed for many, many reasons. But today is gonna be a completely different day. Today we're gonna give you guys many, many tools for you to become a cataract surgeon. So since I'm, I'm gonna have my slides soon, we're gonna start with somebody from, uh, from the panel who I really admire, Dr. Diego Altamirano. It's from South America, it's from Chile. It's, it's a very good surgeon. And you know, he's you know, uh, doing his, uh, he's gonna tell us about his learning curve. And he's doing a learning curve in one of the best places in the world, like Bascom Palmer. And guess who is his mentor? Another from the panel. So we're gonna have a great time here. So Diego, we would love to understand what it's uh, what what is a cat as your journey, you know, right in this in this learning curve. Okay, let me share here. Can you hear me? Yes, perfectly. Yes. Okay, let me share here. Give me one second. Um, Um, can you see my screen or not? Yes, perfectly. Yeah, yes. Yes. Okay, so hello everyone. I'm uh, Diego Altamirano. I'm from Chile. Uh, currently, I'm doing my fellowship, cornea and uh, uh, ocular surgery fellowship at Bascom Palmer. But today, I'm going to uh, share my personal learning group. I know that there are many um, surgeon in the in 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 early career here, so I'm going to share, and I hope it will be helpful for you. So, when you are going to learn, let me see, can you you know to go here? So, when you are going to learn a new technique, uh, for me the first step is that you have to go to the books and read the technique. You have to know the theory first, okay? So I'm going to tell you what I used to do. So I used to read the books, go to any good books that you can have. For example, uh, read the first uh, chapter about, I don't know, uh, incision. So you read the incision chapter, then you go to the um, YouTube channel, you put incision, and I used to watch at least after the first chapter, at least 10 videos about what I read, okay? So that is the first step for me in my learning curve. The second step that you have to practice. So I don't have any uh, financial interest here, but I used to have the Kitaro web lab. So I used to practice my uh, capsular exit here. But I think for me in my learning curve, the most important was I used to buy a pig guy. So after your clinic, you can stay at the hospital and you can practice the rexes, incisions, how, how, how you can put an intraocular lens. Uh, you can practice the uh, scleral tunnel, improve your fine movement and improve your skill. So you already read the books, watch the videos, 
you practice. Then the third step for me, this one was the more important. So when I was in my um, second year of residency, on my vacation, I went to India, the south of India. So we spent there three weeks and I did 60 uh, cataract surgery by myself. So this was crucial in my learning group because it's different when you do 60 cases in six months comparing to 60 cases in three weeks. So this was really fast and efficient for me. The fourth step, so when I started my uh, third year of residency, this is really important. You have to record and you have to watch your video. Why? Because you are going to have complications. You are going to have mistakes. You uh, are going to have many complications. For example, here I had a capsular. Can you see the video or no? Uh, yeah. Ivo, yeah? Can you see the video? Yes, yes perfectly. Okay. So, for example, here, during my learning curve, okay, here I'm doing a cataract surgery. So, I had a capsular rupture because I went to the periphery with the phaco. So, I watched the video and now I know that I don't have to go with the phaco to the periphery. So, you have to learn from your mistake. So on the second one here, I'm doing a vitrectomy through the main incision. So another mistake that I never did again, again, uh, a vitrectomy through the main incision. So you are going to have complications. You have to record and watch those complications. So that was my learning curve. That was for me really fast and efficient. So after that, you can uh, master the phaco emulsification, but you have to know that during your learning group, you are going to have complications, you are going to make mistakes, but you have to have motivation to improve your skills. So that is the, my experience during this journey. Amazing, Diego. Amazing. I think you touched so many, many, many points that, that we're going to discuss uh, with this amazing panel. Uh, you're talking about feedback, right? You're talking about recording and, and see what's happening, yeah. how you can improve. You're talking about mentorship. You're talking about understanding the journey because we're going to have complications. We need to know that since the beginning, right? Sometimes we, we think in this amazing learning curve, nothing's going to happen to us, and that's not reality. But you said something that really uh, struck to me, that it's motivation. Because there's yeah. research. There's research talking about dopamine and how we can learn faster if we are motivated. Uh, it, it was great. Uh, Guillermo, you, you are his mentor. What do you think about this? We lost Guillermo, I think. <laughs> so Lisa, you can start sharing my 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 slides you can hear me oh, yes no perfect oh. okay um Diego, uh well i i, I just want to comment the, the video was the everything was uh very good i didn't review his presentation but he touched on a one book that i think everyone should read phaco dynamics everyone should read that book because you can practice all you want in, in, in surgical models and everything. But if you understand your machine and you let the machine do most of the work, um, that's a very important. You can have very good hands, you can, but if you understand the way your machine works and the way the physics work of, of, the, of the FACO surgery, the learning curve is gonna be so much faster. Great, so Lisa, please uh, start sharing the, the presentation whenever you can. So we're gonna do a little introduction. I think the introduction is gonna be great uh, in the matter that we're, we're gonna just touch these amazing points that Diego talked about. Um, 
The first thing is I want to welcome everybody. We had an amazing video, but for matters of time, uh, let's put it in the end. It's an amazing video, actually, you know, in the moon. Uh, let's go to the next one, please. And we want to always we always want to know where you guys are from. Uh, there's many people. That we have a lot of people today. We are very happy, and we we would love to know where you're from. So please, in the chat, tell us where you're from, and also follow Faca Mentors in all social media. We were talking with Diego, for example. He's improving his LinkedIn as we speak. We always say that every you know cataract surgeon should have an amazing LinkedIn. Um, account okay next one please and this is one of the amazing uh, quotes that we're going to say in every single situation uh, this comes from the u.s from the marines and for everybody listening it's very important to understand that in those moments in that learning curve you're, you're gonna you're not gonna race to the occasion you're gonna sink to the level of your training and this means that we need to train and you need to train perfectly we need to use deliberate practice we're going to talk about it and this is going to be one of the key secrets to have a better learning curve next one please uh it's an honor for me to have this amazing panel i'm going to go again uh we have diego altamirano from chile now in bascom palmer christos infantiles from the u.s charistan blanco from the philippines amazing to have you uh, thanks for being here with us may sung ang from myanmar you know, very interesting because we have we are from many different places around the world. Karen, also from the U.S., thank you for being here with us. And we have, you know, uh, people from the in-house like Guillermo Amezcua from Mexican, but in Bascom Palmer and Ischiaki Anwar from Bangladesh. Next one, please. So the the, the key here every, in every webinar we say we're going to have the iceberg approach. We're going to talk about what happens, you know, we talk about capsule rexis, but we need to, we want to go deep. We want to go to the roots. And I think that's a, the second tip of the night. You know, if we go and you make the questions that nobody asks, that's where the very interesting secrets are. Next one, please. This is how it's going to work tonight. We're going to do a quick introduction. Uh, already, you know, uh, Diego already talked about their personal learning curve because of matters of time. And we're going to talk about fundamentals, mentors. We're going to go to capsule rexes, to stop and chop. And we're going to talk about a new technique. I think Christos is going to do something amazing because we can learn fast and efficiently, but we're always learning. You know, we need to, what happens when we have a new technique? Oh, we're a very good cataract surgeon. Yeah, but it's a new technique. So I think in the end, we're going to understand that we can always be learning. Next one. Uh, what is FAC Mentors? We are building an ecosystem. We were building an ecosystem in where, you know, that we have colleagues from all over the world, and we're going to give you tools to become the surgeon you want to be. How we are doing that in the next one? It's by doing a big community. And you can see it today. Philippines, Myanmar, Bangladesh, uh, we don't have Europe because they're sleeping, but if they were not sleeping, we will have them, right? And we have from the US, Mexico to Chile. So we're basically all over the continent, except for those who are sleeping. So I always ask this question, it's 2020, and are we learning cataract surgery the same way we learned, we learned cataract surgery the past 20 years? Can we ch change that? Can we make it more efficient? Next one, please. And this is everything that is surrounding not only surgery, but surgical education is changing. And you can see there from economic challenges, but also from, from changing an ethical climate. So, so is, it, is it good now to learn in a human being while you can learn in an artificial eye on a simulator? You know, there is many things surrounding surgical education. We need to be very aware of how it's, how it's changing rapidly. Next one. And, and also, you know, we have two colleagues, actually we have two colleagues from the US and another two colleagues right in the US. And I came by this article a couple of years ago and it, it struck me because it was so honest from a colleague telling that, you know, this simple procedure that we say that it's FACO, it wasn't 
that simple as everybody thinks, right? It has a learning curve that, you know, it requires a lot of time and a lot of knowledge and a lot of practice. So I recommend you guys to, to, to read what another colleague thinks about what happened in that learning curve. And you're gonna learn a lot and you, you can apply a lot in your le learning curve. Next one, please. So uh, the thing is, and the reason I'm asking these questions is because if you're learning, in an environment that, ha that has these three uh, important things. It's the first thing is the time constraints. You cannot take two, three, four hours to learn FACO because, right, you know, the OR has, uh, has to move on, the, the mentor has its own agenda. There's also high pressure environment because there's, um, there can be uh, important consequences to patients and also patient safety, it's imperative at all times. Guillermo, tell me, you, you are in Bascom Palmer in the US with all these constraints. How do you manage to teach in an environment so difficult like this? Um, I mean, I think you have to create uh, protocols. Uh, you have to, um, to have a system in place. Uh, you have to have schedules. You have to have people that are willing to be involved. Um, and you have to uh, put pressure on the students and the residents and um, they need to their practice, uh, they need to do their reading, and they need to commit to um, see the patients before and after. Uh, so I think the whole system needs to work in order uh, to achieve a good training and have the numbers uh, to graduate very competent um, surgeons. Perfect. Ishtiake, from the other part of the world, you are in the same situation, uh, teaching a lot in the OR. What do you think about this? Yeah, I just want to make a comment about, about Diego's presentation. He has mentioned something very important. What your mind does not know, your eyes cannot see. So you have to go through books and uh, to learn what you are going to do. And regarding that, you have to have a very, this is a culture, what I tell my uh, peers that, you know, training and uh, utilization of uh, all the facilities that you have. So great. You have uh -huh. great mentors and then you train all the others. Excellent. Next one, please. So uh, we did a survey, all right? It's a survey that it, it's basically in Latin America and it was in Spanish. That's why we didn't put it all over the world. But we were asking people about the quality of teaching. And there is uh, almost a 70% that said there was bad or regular. And then when we talk about the number of surgery, we can see there that only about 15 to 20% of people do more than 50 cases. Um, we know, and we have Karen and we have Christos, that the magic number right in the US is 80, 86 cataracts, if I'm not mistaken, from the certification system. Um, how was your uh, learning curve, Kristen, in the US? How many procedures were you able to do? So I think a lot depends on the geography of where you are. Um, in places that have uh, big centers without any competition for other teaching programs around, it can be in the four or five hundreds uh, before you graduate. For me, I trained at Mount Sinai in New York City. Um, I think my year, I actually had the most of anybody in the city and I was at 212. So substantially lower, I think, than um, you would get at, let's say, the place I went to medical school, the University of Florida, um, where they routinely get, I think, three or 400 cases at least. So um, a lot is dependent on the geography, um, but rarely will you get uh, double digits. It's almost always triple digit cataract surgeries at almost every program. Um, I think Karen can probably speak about her experience too. Yeah, I agree with what Christo said. Um, my program was in Michigan and we got in the low 200s, but it's it's all about how competitive the area is and how many other trainees uh, you're competing against. So most programs in the US try to limit the trainees so that uh, everyone can get, you know, at least 100, 150, I would say most programs hit that number um, easily. Interesting, interesting. So you're, you're having a, a decent amount uh, amount of cases. I think that's very important. And we know that the mentorship is also very important in the US. We're trying to, you know, to build that in, in Latin America. Next one, please. 
uh, also another important thing, and we could talk a lot about hours of that, is that are you a cataract surgeon if you did 100, 200 cases, but there were simple cases and not complications? What about complication management during residency or anterior vitrectomy? So when we asked this to people, we understood that uh, you know there is almost 90% that will do less than 10 or 20 cases of complications and almost no uh, teaching of anterior vitrectomy. So I think that's very important and we will love to discuss this in the end of your presentations. Next one. So what we want and our dream of our life is to do this uh, concept called the wormhole, right? Is the wormhole will be to hack time and to make everything efficient, to save time, to save resources, uh, to, to see effort from the students actually, and to win them, you know, a better performance, to have a better um, learning curve. Next one. So we developed this program for everybody there, you know, who wants to know a little more about the program and to have a mentor around the world and to do, we are gonna talk about virtual simulation. We're gonna talk about artificial eyes. You can take a picture from that QR and, you know, full, fill a couple of, the uh, information and we're gonna contact you. Next one. This is what we call then the cataract wormhole methodology. Next one. What we want, and here I would love to, to know what Guillermo and Ishtake think, it's not only to go to the, you know, uh, technician part if, by doing surgery, we think you can do an online mentor mentorship, then you can do simulation that can be virtual or with artificial eyes, then do something very specific with a liberal practice in surgery, then somebody to help you how to insert yourself, even in your own healthcare system, in your country, in your own clinic, and then to build a community is like the, what we are doing today, right? To build a community between surgeons so we can keep learning as Christos is gonna tell us in the end. Next one. This is how it looks like. We, we believe that it could be a new learning curve in where, uh, the, and this is the important part I wanted to mention, the patient comes after you learn it a lot. You learn it what FACO is. Next one. So then what is to be a surgeon? I would like to ask the panel because if we wanna be a surgeon, we need to understand what is to be a surgeon, right? Next one. And uh, just put, put the volume down, but I want you to, to look at this guy and, and imagine if it, he doesn't look like, uh, just, just run it without uh, volume. There you go. It's, it's going slow, but you can see that this guy is using everything. Not only his mind, but two arms, two feet, and he has a practically, you know, he's singing the Beatles with his guitar, and you can see in every extremity of his body, he's using something. So for us, that's a cataract surgeon, right? Two hands, two feet, and a brain, you know, organizing everything. Next one. Also the brain, we were talking with Guillermo. Where, where is it? So you're gonna learn a lot? Okay, where, where is this gonna be stored? You know, are you doing something about to store this information correctly? Next one. And we have three uh, ladies here, and we, I would love to know to 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 ask you what is to be a surgeon. You know, is is if you can't operate in heels, you can't operate. This is an amazing book to talk. What is to be a surgeon when you are a woman? Therese, I'm going to start with you. Do, do you have any any comments about what is to be a surgeon? Oh, well, here in the Philippines, it's really not, there's, there, well, there's really not an issue when it comes to being a female surgeon, like as an ophthalmologist, female ophthalmologist, I didn't really feel any disadvantage if you're talking about that. I didn't think my being a woman was a disadvantage in becoming a female ophthalmologist at all. Excellent. May? Hi. Yeah, as you said before, I think yeah, your mind and your hand is connected. Your brains uh, go where you went and your hands also go. So you need to uh, control your 
thinking. And if you want to uh, get a nice CCC, uh, you need to uh, imagine the nice CCC went and then the, your, your hands goes. So the minds and hands are connected. Perfect. Karen? Yeah, I think, I mean, there's some challenges, I think, for many professions for, for women. But I will say that I think women also bring a lot of things to the field um, in different ways than men can. And I think uh, the more patients appreciate that, the more, uh, the stronger that we can be in our profession as well. Very interesting comment. And something we need to know, uh, in a couple of years, there's gonna be more ophthalmologists, you know, women than men, and they're great, great surgeons. And we love to have you here. I learned, you know, basically my two mentors were women and they were amazing. They teach me so well. Next one. So what, what about- uh, we, we, uh, we had, they had a met, uh, big data project from uh, general surgery and the woman came like, by far, you know, better with uh, and complication rates on and residency training than males. So wow, uh, yeah, that's a paper that's published. Wow, and since you since you are there, Guillermo, I'm gonna ask the guys now. What about how this uh, being a surgeon uh, is changing in the last years? Right, in the last uh, thirty years ago, to be a surgeon was to be like a semi god, right? Oh, you you were so skilled and everybody would respect. What what about now? Uh, what do you think this new role of the surgeon is? I mean, what you, do you mean like what about now because what's happening right now in the world or in the past 10 years? Uh, no, no, in general, general concept. I mean, at least for, for, uh, for if we, the topic of cataract surgery, I think the, the, the outcomes are expected to be, um, you know, we are talking about refractive surgery now. It's not what it used to be a cataract surgeon just to like take a very dense cataract and bring vision. Now you have to give perfect vision. So um, that's that's good and bad at the same time. Um, but um, because, you know, the, the, the patients ask for better results and your colleagues, and sometimes the, the, the master surgeon is not gonna pass surgery to, uh, uh, to, the, to the trainee. Uh, you know, you have uh, more uh, chances of uh, a complication with the resin or slowing you down. So that, that, but at the same time, you know, I think we have better protocols, more simulation that can make it easier. So, yeah. Yeah, I think it's, I think it's safer too. You know, 30 years ago, people didn't want to speak up, right? Because of that sort of surgeon is the head honcho in the room. Um, I think they still are, but the culture, at least in the U.S., has become such that if somebody sees a problem, they speak up before a patient gets hurt. Um, they've studied this you know, tremendously. They look at different countries, different countries have different cultures about this, but you want to promote that in your operating room that yes, there's a hierarchy, but nobody is afraid of speaking up when there are safety issues. And that has really improved, I think, the last few decades. Uh, with that, I think you lose some of the quote respect or whatever you want to call it. Um, in the OR, like everybody's working as a team. It's not just like only the surgeon that's, you know, getting the credit. You have to give credit to the entire team. Uh, but the trade-off is that, um, you know, safety is, is much improved. And for ophthalmology, that's really important because, you know, there are two eyes, different things can happen. Um, and so it's always good to have that um, environment of safety and, and willingness to, to open up and talk. Very interesting, very interesting, Kristen. I agree 100%. And we're going to finish this uh, introduction talking about, you know, we were also talking with Guillermo. He's a, an amazing uh, tennis fan. And, you know, I put that picture in honor of him. I put another one of my, you know, my heroes, Usain Bolt, training with this new technology and also basketball, one of my, my favorite sports, you know, using technology to train. So this is my questions to you, right? Uh, uh, Diego was talking about uh, measuring yourself and metrics and, and are we using enough technology? Are we knowing how we, our learning curve is going? Are we having the best feedback ever? Are we using other tools to improve our outcomes? So I think that's gonna be very important, important at the moment you wanna learn more efficient and faster. Next one. So another one, and another important thing, we talk about the OR. Please play, press play. And uh, my humble opinion is that 
we can do a lot about taking that patient outside the equation, right? And to, to learn efficient and to learn fast, we need to remove the human from that equation. Next one. Uh, and, you know, uh, we, we, we were seeing Usain Bolt, we can see Stephen Curry, we can see so many amazing athletes. And they have this mantra is that you're born in a way, you can be good, you can have the great genetics, you can move your hands fast, you can be aware. But if you want to be great, you need to train. I would love to, you were talking about your own um your, your own learning curve, uh, Diego. Tell me a little bit about what you think about the training part of that learning curve. I think the training part is more important. So nowadays you have like technology to train. You have, uh, for me, my, um, one of my best friends is the YouTube. You want to learn a technique. You have many, um, many videos about the technique so um but for me the most important nowadays you have all for learning so you only need your motivation to learn if you want to be a surgeon you have to have motivation for that great and we were talking about metrics and when you go to a virtual simulator and you're doing uh, a terrible trek to me that somebody will that will not teach you because remember the environment right you are stressed you want the patient to go well to have a good outcome so nobody's gonna take the time to train you in a calm way and give you a good feedback so i wanted to show you this uh, amazing uh, image of how for example when you're doing a uh, virtual simulation the machine is going to tell you how many bits is in the anterior chamber. Did you pull uh, vitreous from the posterior chamber to the anterior chamber? Were you efficient? Did you have good efficiency? How was the tissue treatment? Next one. So uh, again, guys, we want to be fast and we want to train well. We need to have metrics. We need to have feedback from a mentor, but we need to have metrics. Next one. And next one. And, and listen to this, this is a good friend of mine. You can see his name there. He didn't want to talk about it because he's a little shy today, but you can see his performance in time. You know, the machine will give him challenges and it will compare him with a pep normal population from his uh, country, from his um, uh, continent. And you, you see how you're performing. And this is a very good thing while you're turning uh, when you're training, you benchmark, you put milestones, you put objectives, you, you know, and you uh, improvedly get better. Next one. Next one. So what do we need to learn? This is the key, right? We need to be efficient. We need to be fast. We need to understand what do we need to learn. And in the next one, you know, this is an amazing video we did too. Hope it runs a little bit faster but it's Neo in the matrix, right? We love, can you put it a little slower? Uh, if it goes slower and, and just pause it, but it's Neo in the matrix when Morpheus asks him, just pause it hit there, right? So our, our opinion is that FACO is a brain with two hands and two feet synchronizing everything with the good ergonomics of the surgeon and also a patient laying down. What do you think about this Guillermo and Nishtake? What do you think about what FACO is? Yeah, it's synchronization of all the body parts. And uh, we just forget that we have to hear all the sounds from the machine. So, and our mentors talking on the other ears uh, and our brain is processing all these things. So exactly said that, you know, cognitive skills and motor skills. So whatever we hear and see, we have to put it into action. So we need a very good synchronization. That's why uh, I feel that, you know, we should start early. Now, some folks uh, usually ask that, is there an age limit to learn FACO? So this synchronization, uh, it's easier if you start earlier. Amazing. And just to finish the intro, oh, so, sorry, Guillermo. No, no, I agree. Say, no, 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 keep cover. No, and the last one, and we're going to finish the, the introduction. Uh, 
uh, one one back please talking about the three pillars where you're gonna hear us talking all the time about not only the motor skills you need to learn you know how to put your hands how to move your hands how to the vectors will behave in the capsule rexis but also the cognitive skills and about how to make decisions during surgery and most importantly the mindset skills a good surgeon has the correct mindset to have a peak performance state doing surgery so uh it's an honor guys to have you we're gonna stop sharing the screen and now we're gonna have Therese that he's gonna talk about the fundamentals and mentor as well Therese, it's an honor to have you here with us you can share Hi, your screen. yes okay okay we are seeing it too big. Okay, I yes, I know. There you go. Can you see it? Perfect. Okay, good. Okay, so let me start now. Okay, so good morning. Good morning from this part of from the Philippines. So thank you for this opportunity to share with you how we do FACO in this part of the world. So these were what I did during my residency training at the Philippine General Hospital to get the hang of FACO. So these are my not-so-secret weapons in learning FACO fast and efficiently. I have no financial interest in anything that will be mentioned in this short talk. So first, know the basics by heart. Read, 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 and read. You cannot learn FACO without reading. And then second, assist and talk to your mentors as often as you can. Talk about techniques, what to do, what not to do during FACO. I owe almost everything I know about FACO to these people. I am a left-handed surgeon and all my mentors are right-handed. So really had to talk about techniques while in training in case they had to rescue me intraoperatively. Third is to review as many videos as you can, analyze every step and technique and adopt a technique that will go well with your hand. So I lost count on how many, how many times I watched my videos, my mentor's videos, YouTube videos, just, to, just so I can internalize the proper positions of my slots. So my main port and my side port, how to uh, not make my iris prolapse uh, on my suture. So, though, so watch your videos. And then next, uh, the fourth um, weapon that I'd like to share is foot control. So FACO is a four-limb surgery. We always talk about our hands, the dominant, non-dominant, but it's actually our foot doing most of the job. We have three foot pedal positions. So position one is irrigation, position two, irrigation and aspiration, three, um, irrigation, aspiration, and FACO emulsification. So the usual uh, steps in holding the lens material our position one, two, three, and then back to two. So as we chop, but beginning surgeons will have a hard time holding the lens material when they go back to position two. So there are machines that vibrate in between positions, uh, but since I'm using Centurion, the vibration is hardly felt. So I had always, I always had a problem of losing the nuclear material from position three and then back to position two during chopping. So the Centurion guys here in the Philippines helped me by widening the range, widening the range of position two since I'm on this position most of the time anyway. So I hope this hack help works well on you. So you will just go to your user settings on their machine and then check on this part. And then the fifth tip that I'd like to share with you is the pothole chop. So bulk of difficulty during surgery is on nuclear disassembly. And then the most common technique is divide and conquer. And then others use the stop and chop. I think May will talk about that later. And then others, um, others just want to do the quick chop. So this is all what we this is what we all wish for. No? So uh, it's when you just try to barbecue the nucleus and then just chop the nuclear parts like a pizza. So but a good technique taught to me by one of my mentors, Dr. Richard Ko, is called the pothole chop, which is a combination of these three basic techniques. So what happens here is that you create a pothole through two to three quick grooves with your foot pedal on position three to make the front 
vertical border that will accommodate the phaco tip as you hold the nucleus on position, position two while you bring both instruments together to do the chop. So again, the pothole with its inner front border oriented vertically facilitates the counter pressure needed to initiate the chop. So after you do the first chop, you can just rotate the nucleus and chop the rest of it like pizza. Um, here's another video of my younger colleague, Dr. Patricia Concepcion during her residency training. So, so here she is doing her pre uh with her foot pedal on position one, then two. Um, then she alternates her foot pedal positions between two and three as she does the actual pothole. So with the vertical wall supporting the phaco tip, she actually had the option not to put on any phaco power while pulling her instruments close together to do the actual chopping. So for beginning surgeons who loses hold of the nucleus during chopping, the vertical wall of the pothole chop will be to your disadvantage. So this method of nuclear disassembly does not require gifted hands and is consistently reproducible even for beginners and is actually probably good for about 95% of the cataracts. So again, these are my tips to learn FACO fast and efficiently. Always remember that the combination of basic knowledge and proper muscle memory creates purposeful movements which makes your phacos safer, faster, and more efficient without really trying. So there, thank you. Amazing, thank you, thank you very much. I think it were amazing tips and many people are gonna be very happy with those tips, Cheris. Especially I like the, the, the foot pedal, right, tip. Is I, I always joke that phaco happens outside the eye, right? We, we're used to see the YouTube, video and things that everything happens there but no it happens in your hands and especially in your food knowing the phaco dynamics so karen you're next uh karen is going to talk a little bit about capsule rex yes let me just share my screen here okay so i'm going to talk about how to practice and perfect capsule rex can everybody see this okay perfect Okay, um, so here are my top five tips. The first is where to hold the rexus as you're making it. Um, and I recommend that you grasp the flap peripherally and near to the fold, but not at or on the fold of the, the flap. Um, I recommend that you keep the chamber as full as possible with um, cohesive viscoelastic as possible. The cohesive ones are heavier. They help to flatten the um, capsule, which makes the rexus less likely to run out. Um, pull perpendicular to the fold, but as you get uh, farther and um, farther away, as your flap gets longer, then you start to bring it more centrally to keep your rexus in the correct circular manner. Um, an important step is practicing moving about your wound. One of the common problems for early surgeons is pressing against the sides of the wound um, as they're trying to make the rexus, which both um, causes wrinkles and distortion in your cornea, and it also causes you to end up putting a lot of pressure against the eye where if something slips, your rexus will run out um, very quickly. And then my last tip is avoiding vertical forces. So don't pull upwards. Um, try to keep the, the forces relatively flat and up against the capsule. Um, so one of my favorite things to recommend is using the tomato to practice on. And um, as we were discussing earlier, there's lots of ways to practice rexies, but um, if you have a fresh tomato or you um, dip it in boiling water for 10 seconds and then in cold water to soften and loosen the skin, um, you can do quite a bit of practicing, especially if you put some push pins in to simulate your um, wound and that'll help you learn to move about the wound. And then you can uh, make markings on your tomato about the rexus size and practice the forces and the direction you need to um, use to create the proper rexus. Um, I'm also a, a large fan of um, people practicing doing a rexus with the cystotome or the bent needle only, as well as trying it with the utratas or micro forceps as well. Having the skills to do either way can really um, improve your skills and help you get out of tricky situations when one may work better than the other. 
Um, I have a, a brief video here of one of my residents practicing with um, using the cystotome only and practicing the skills that we're just talking about here as well. And so again, uh, generally you want to be either grabbing or pressing, if in the case of the cystotome, near to the flap fold, but not on the flap fold and relatively peripheral. And then practicing with your forces being um, kind of along the, the course of the rexus that you're hoping to, to pull the um, capsular rexus along. Um, and of course, if your rexus does start to misbehave and travel outwards, there's plenty of maneuvers to try to rescue it, like the little rescue maneuver that you can find on YouTube easily. Um, and then of course, there's other strategies that can be used um, to make great rexes. There's the Zepto device, which um, applies electric current to make a nice circular rexus. You can use the femtosecond laser to make a circular rexus. Um, of course, practicing on a surg surgical simulator like the IC can be helpful. And then the Varus um, guide, which is a, a capsule rexus guide, an actual um, piece of silicone that's placed on the capsule and kind of adheres down to it to help guide your rexus around. Um, but all these things are good training tools and good techniques to use. Um, but then at the end of the day, having the skills to use your cystotome and use your forceps are really important. So plenty of practice with tomato eyes, with the simulators, um, with anything you can. And then my other recommendation is if you're in cases with your um, attending or consultant, um, they may be willing to let you practice one step like the Rexus in a case that they are doing um, because often it's easier for an experienced surgeon to complete a case successfully even if the Rexus isn't perfect um, than it would be for you to practice a Rexus on an eye that you're hoping to complete the surgery on yourself if there's anything that goes wrong. So those are my capsule rexus tips. Thank you. Uh, can you leave the, the last slide? I think oh, yeah. it's so powerful, Kristen. Thank you so much because there's a lot of people asking. Uh, first of all, uh, congratulations, amazing presentation. I really liked it. You said many, many things. One of the things I love the most is you were talking about doing a capsule rexus with the cystotome. And there's so many people not doing that in, in all over the world. Uh, because, but you said something important. If you understand the behavior of the capsule and you understand the vectors, you can do it with any instrument. So that makes you, right? That makes you be a better surgeon because you understand better. Uh, you talked about uh, even uh, doing practice in a tomato. So nobody has excuses, at least to start understanding how the, ver the vectors behave. And you show in the last, uh, the, the various, do you have any experience in teaching and with, with that instrument? And please uh, tell the audience, I love that uh, that instrument. Uh, it, it's not an instrument, it's, it's, it's an accessory, but tell us a little bit about it. Yeah, so I personally have not used it, but several of the other faculty um, at my institution have used it and um, have used it with great success. It's, it's good um, for helping you center your rexus, for getting used to the sizing. I'm not sure it's something I would use for every single case, but for cases that might be difficult, or if you're an early learner, um, trying to make sure that your rexus is as perfect as possible, it's very easy to use um, and it's very safe to use. Great, so it could be a very interesting tool, you know, when people are learning. I don't know if Guillermo or Ishtiake have any comments. Yeah, yeah I, I just wanted to ask uh, Christos and uh, all the uh, guys from US that, uh, most of the US people use uh, forceps, but while in Asia, we see that we are using cystotome. So what do you think that uh, this determines? If the mentor is doing, uh, that is we push our fellows to do it or how should we approach that? I think, I think a lot determines on uh, the other equipment you use. So um, I did a global ophthalmology fellowship. I actually trained at LV Prasad for my uh, sutureless extra cap uh, SICS training. We use cystotones there. A lot depends on the viscoelastic you use. So if you're going to use methyl cellulose uh, and not uh, an actual viscoelastic, um, then uh, it has lower molecular weight. It comes out of the eye easier. And so using something like utratas uh, are more difficult because it opens the wound and allows for the methyl cellulose to leave. And so if you're going to use something like a dispersive viscoelastic, um, you can use either or, but if you're going to use methyl cellulose, it makes it a lot more challenging, especially when you train. Um, 
to do the Rexus with Utratus. And so early on in training, it's really nice if you can get away with it to use the higher quality viscoelastics because it's much more forgiving for the Rexus. Very good. Uh, so now we have May. May, uh, it's a pleasure to have you here with us. Thank you. Yeah. Hello, everyone. I'm Fei. I'm May from Myanmar Yango Eye Hospital. Uh, the, my topic today is chop and top, which is the most versatile technique. The aim of the FAGO is to emulsify the center core of the nucleus uh, to get a safe and uh, quick surgery. Uh, the nucleus emulsification can be performed adopting various techniques. This slide shows horizontal and vertical top. And uh, it refers to directions and way taken to be chopper to split the nucleus. Chopper or splitter is a valuable second instrument for FACO. Upper left figure shows horizontal chopping technique. There are three steps. First chopper needs to go towards the equator. Embed the FACO tip and make a straight horizontal top movement to move the two instruments apart. A vertical top involves movement of topper tip and fecal needle tip in a vertical direction after embedding. The lower picture shows cross-section view of the movement. This video shows the topper tip going around the lens equator, bringing them together and apart, separating the nucleus into two halves and emulsifying with the fecal probe. So you need to go to the equator for the horizontal chop. And this video shows the chopping tip going around the, uh, not going around the lens equator, just uh, uh, within the capsular resist, and then both are abandoned into the nucleus. And the stop and top technique for nucleus removal during cataract surgery blend aspects of the divide and conquer method with sand figo top. Some sergeants use it as a stepping stone before moving to perform a full top technique. The idea is to make a central, central trough deeply and crack it into two halves completely. Rotate the nucleus 90 degree by placing the splitter or topper. Pearls for stop and top are to engage the nucleus uh, in the middle and to ensure tip occluded and bar it before topping. Uh, it is important to top towards bed avoiding fecal tip to prevent breaking occlusion. Pull the tips of instrument apart and fecal emulsify the nuclear fragments, then rotate the nucleus 180 degree and re repeat the same step. And this slide show, uh, uh, this slide show FIGO setting in stop and top, high vacuum, uh, low uh, low ultrasound, low aspiration rate, and moderately high water height are important parameter for stop and top. Uh, the pulse are in soft cataract reduce the vacuum and ultrasound significantly, and vice versa for hard cataract. They will feel the same to the sergeant with alter settings. Uh, this slide shows typical settings for different machines, but the sergeant should change the parameter individually. This video shows top and top technique. The depth of the initial group need to be more for soft, softer cataract. Correct placement of the two instruments at the bottom of the trench and forces to be applied in an opposite direction. The nuclear split into two halves and emulsify the remaining nucleus. And wider group is not required in soft cataract, but hard cataract will require a wider trench. The trench should be deeper centrally than peripherally. When cataract is very soft or hard, don't, don't do stop and top because trying to get out the first quadrant is very difficult. To inverted T, hence became T and C and hybrid between stop and top and divide and conquer. Conquer. This makes surgery very repeatable. Thank you so much. 
Wow, man, I'm impressed. Uh, I think you did a great job in something that it's not easy. And you talk even about the parameters in different machines. Uh, I'm loving this. I think I'm going to have this video. I'm going to go back to it to understand. Thank you very much. I think fake a chop. Um, it's an amazing technique. It will save a lot of ultrasound and it will be very helpful um, in, in many, many cases. Guillermo, you love to, to do horizontal fake chop. Tell us a little bit about it. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I think she, she explained the technique very nicely. And, and it's a technique that it saves uh, a lot of surgical time and it saves a lot of endothelium. Um, so it's definitely a, a, a technique to have in your um, toolbox. Uh, it is my preferred technique for uh, most of the cataracts that we see here. If it's soft cataract, it's very difficult to do. Uh, but uh, I really recommend it in, 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 in the cases. And it's... And this those cases with three plus nuclear cataracts that you can start learning. And if you want to do stop and chop to kind of start learning how to uh, go under the iris without seeing uh, and, and start practicing that, that first step, that's very important. Thank you very much. Our last presentation, we're doing, we're doing great in time and we're gonna a little bit discussion in the end. So Christos, it's, it's a pleasure to have you here. And it's a pleasure you choose uh, something very interesting, right? How you, after you're a surgeon, you can learn new techniques. So please. You're mute. No, it, it went on and off again. Yeah. There you yeah, go. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> All right. Sorry about that. Um, one thing to add to the um, just uh, thing for young surgeons, preparation is so key, uh, making sure that you feel prepared for the OR, leaving nothing uh, that you don't know about the patient uh, will really re re remove any of the nervousness that you might have during surgery. Because the last thing you want is layers of anxiety. And so if you're at least prepared and know everything about the patient, and think about what you'll need during the surgery ahead of time, then in the moment you'll retain clarity. And that's really important when you're, when you're training. So uh, my talk this evening is gonna be rotary. Uh, Can you still hear me? Yeah. Okay, so I thought somebody said something. So my uh, talk is gonna be rotary chop. Uh, it's for, uh, specifically for this encounter, it's for teaching chop and uh, tackling mature cataracts here. And so, um, no relevant financial disclosures. The technique is called rotary chop because if you remember the old rotary phones that we used to dial with, you'd put your finger in this hole and you'd spin the dial around. Uh, and this is called the rotary phone and that's where the name comes from. And this is the technique here. After I clean off the epinucleus and cortex, make sure I can spin the lens around. Um, I clean off the surface of the nucleus. And then on my typical normal chop settings, I will uh, bury the phaco tip into the nucleus here. And instead of doing my typical vertical chop, I'll stop and I'll come out of that hole and I'll rotate it 180 degrees. And then I'll use that initial hole for my chopper. So I bury into the lens again and then I go into that hole with my chopper and I bring the two together and then I separate them apart. And so making that hole allows me to uh, avoid having to put pressure on the anterior uh, part of the lens. So for anybody who's uh, ever tried uh, learning chop, uh, vertical chop especially, you know that you'll end up pushing the cataract off of your phaco and you break occlusion or if you're trying horizontal chop, uh, you don't end up going all the way on the periphery. It's scary. It's a scary place to work in, especially when you're uh, a trainee. This was one of my residents trying it for the first time, actually. Never had chopped before. Makes that hole. And so you can see, I'm going to pause it here. Instead of having to go out into the periphery here with horizontal chop, where trainees don't like to do it, and instead of having to uh, push the lens off of the phaco and break occlusion, you create a nice hole for yourself uh, to place your chopper and then bring the instruments together and then apart. So it's a great 
hybrid step when you're learning CHOP, uh, how to learn um, the, uh, the process. So um, it also works for dense cataracts. So this is a, uh, and this is how I ended up developing it because um, it ends up just being helpful for really hard cataracts uh, that you can't get your chopper deep down into the, the uh, posterior part of the cataract. This is a pretty dense cataract here. And so making sure I'm rotating it and then I'll skip ahead here to burrowing down into the lens. Instead of doing my normal chop, I'll stop, come out, spin it around. And so this can be a technique that's used even for advanced surgeons, but it really shines when you're trying to teach people uh, how to chop. And then again, burrowing down into the lens. I'll just fast forward here for time's sake and you can see cracks very nicely because you can get deep down into the lens with that initial groove. So if you want to learn more, you can just go to a PubMed and type in rotary chop. There's uh, videos and actually Karen on this panel helped, uh, helped with the paper too. So um, with that, uh, I'll take any questions. Wow. I'm, made, I'm doing that tomorrow, Christos. I'm <laughs> loving that yeah, technique. Yeah. Wow. Tell me, tell me about the second instrument. Do you have a preference? Yeah. So uh, for me, I use the Nickman 2 Quick Chop. Um, you can really use anything that has a reasonable uh, vertical length. Um, so a Rosen chopper can work too. Um, anything where you can feel like you can get down into that hole, right? Because the point of that is to create space so that you can get your chopper down uh, and cut across a dense cataract uh, or a softer one. You could use a Cybell chopper if you're, you're gonna be just learning how to do this technique. Um, so you don't need to use that chopper specifically, but. Um, for really dense cataracts, I recommend something like a, a Nickman, N-I-C-H-M-A-N, I believe it's spelled. Amazing. I bet you that there is going to be many, many people trying that tomorrow or next week when they, when they are in the OR. I think it's an so I great hope they me and let me know how it goes. Especially because, it, you know, it, makes, it, it make, makes chopping a little easier, right? Oh, totally. So you don't have to go out into the periphery, right? Especially with a small pupil, let's say. Nobody likes to work out on the periphery, especially at the beginning of learning stuff. So you make your hole there and there's no need to get into that area where you're uncomfortable working. Amazing. And then with vertical chop, chop too, um, so many people will try and, and push the chopper down. And if you're just starting out, you'll break the occlusion, which is the biggest thing for vertical chop is to keep occlusion with your phaco tip on, on the cataract. And so this prevents any of that and it just makes you feel much more comfortable. Thank you. Ishtiake, it's also with, with a smile in his face. I'm pretty sure he's going to try this technique. Any comments, <laughs> Yeah, I'm, I just want to ask Christos that, you know, how far would you go with the two holes as far as you can go within the Rexis allows? Yeah, so um, I will do, yeah, I'll mostly do it on the periphery. That way the crack can be, especially from the cataracts, can be long. Um, if it's too short and too too close together, um, it, it might not work as well. So the longer you can go safely, the better. And have you tried it for the black ones? Because we have really bad black ones, uh, really black, uh, some cataracts. Have you tried? I have. Um, I'll, I'll, I, I think in this paper, if not, I'll, I can show another video, but um, I definitely have tried it on uh, much more dense cataracts than this. And um, it's been um, successful. Perfect. No, we're gonna we're gonna reproduce that technique, Christos. I think it's amazing, and thank you very much for sharing. Also for a teaching, uh, you know, a teaching uh, way to, to do it. I think it's great to teach um, to chop with, with that technique. It's safe. Yeah. Uh, so well, we're finishing. I think we did a, a great time in, in. Sorry about the the slides, um, but but we want to go to this because we think they're right there. The secrets, can, can you please um, put again the, the video so it's running? But uh, as you can see there, each image has a point. And 
we think if you want to learn fast and efficiently, first, we need to take the patient outside the equation. We have virtual simulation, we have artificialized, we have many things. One good thing is to deconstruct surgery. Many of the panel talked about the foot pedal, the hand positioning, the mindset. There is so many different things. We need to have a new perspective of surgery and look at it in a different way, I think. And also, this is what we love in, in FACO Mentors and Ophthalmo University, to, to talk about the psychomotor skills, how you move your hands, the decision making, and the mindset skills. Okay, so if, you, if we move to the next one, uh, well, again, guys, uh, for those who want to take a picture in the QR, they want to, you know, be in touch with a mentor all over. If you're in Asia, Istak is there. If you're here, we are here in Latin America. There's mentors all over the place. Next one, please. And, and this is something I really want to talk about with all the panel. We, we, let's go fast, but let's run this video because we, we, we want to learn fast. We want to learn efficiently. What, what is this? Uh, I think Diego also talked about re resilience, talk about face complication, manage compl complex cases, critical thinking. Uh, we think that everything you're going to learn, you're going to store it in your brain. So my question to you, to the panel, we can start with Guillermo, is how, uh, you know, to be in the perfect mind state you know, to have better outcomes. Guillermo. I mean, if you're, if you're uh, early in your career, um, you want to eliminate the stress. So everything that you can control, you want to eliminate. So come well prepared, read about your patients, um, you know, know the, know the microscope, uh, know your pedals, know your machine. Uh, so all those factors that you can actually control, go talk to your nurses, uh, bring everything that's needed to the OR. Because the, the least amount of stress, the better you're gonna you're gonna start. Uh, so control what you can control, and the things that you can control, you're gonna learn uh, as you go. So. Great, Ishtiake. Yeah, practice more in that way that it becomes a part of your cognitive action. So you don't have to think what you are doing. Practice. Great, Charis. Any any comments about how to prepare your mind? For that learning curve, I just want to emphasize. Therese gave a great advice. Talk, talk to your uh, talk to your reps, and you know they will fine tune your instrument. This is like a like a music musical instrument, you know. So it's it it the orchestra. They they fine tune everything before the orchestra. So so you you they can make it easier on you and better. Yes, here the 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 support system here in the Philippines when it comes to. Um, the aftercare of the machines. Uh, we're we're in good communication with the ones who provide the machines for us. Yeah. Thank you very much. Um, May have any comments about that? Because we want to move also now to simulation, and I'm pretty sure that Christos and Karen and Diego, you know, they they try this in their learning curve. Yes, uh, to be a great surgeon, uh, I want to advise you, you need to approach your mentor and ask them to see your operation in OR and also uh, watch your video together and uh, to make them comment to improve your surgery. Completely agree. Mentorship, it's everything, yes. right? So Christos, uh, Karen, uh, Diego, what, what do you think about, we, we talk about to take the patient outside the learning loop, the, the, the equation. Uh, did you have a chance to use the virtual simulation? Ooh, did it make that learn curve easier? For me, the answer was yes. I, um, I use simulators and the IC especially. And um, I think, you know, once you are proficient at using that, then you're ready for the next steps to try those same maneuvers in the eye itself. But I think it's important to, to get your hands on practice materials as much as possible. Yeah, I think um, the benefit of uh, some of the simulators are not necessarily to be exactly like what to expect uh, with the eye. Uh, there is so much training that you have to do, just like a baseball player has to train in terms of getting physically fit. And so your hand-eye coordination has to be on par. Training under a microscope has to be on par. Uh, the last thing you want to do is not know how a microscope works with your foot pedal or whatever. 
when you've got a human being underneath it, right? So um, whether it's simulation or just using your instruments, um, the goal is to prepare. Uh, nothing will be exactly like a human laying under there, but um, my experience has been that uh, part of the benefit of the digital simulation, I've thought, oh, well, this is not exactly like what an eye is, but I still, my hand-eye coordination, my small movements improve the more I use it. And so um, that's one thing to take away is don't expect it to be exactly like real surgery all the time, but yes. the more accurate you could be under that, the more accurate you'll be on a real human as well. Amazing. Uh, I agree a hundred percent. Karen? Yeah, I, I made a comments earlier. I think as much time as you can get practicing, um, getting your hands on um, either practice equipment or on the simulators, it's going to give you the best step forward when you start. Um, I agree. I think the simulate. Oh, yes, yes, sorry. Yes. Yeah, the simulators now are so much better than it was like when I was in training. Because when I was in training, I tried the simulator once and then it was just like the blind leading the blind. I completely stopped. So, and then I just proceeded to just learning it on the on actual patients. So the residents now are, are much luckier for having the simulators available to them. I agree. Uh, you will, you uh, also yes, comment. You, you know about yeah. the simulator, but, but about artificial eyes as well. We have the... Yeah, I, I don't know if... He, if with the bionic eyes there. Yeah, I don't know if, if everyone uh, like uh, have access to the virtual simulation. I didn't have access to virtual simulation, but I had access to, you know, the big eyes, uh, the bionic, the kitaro. So even with that, you can practice and feel more comfortable with the uh, before surgery. Great. Uh, this is a, an image uh, that we had uh, the, when, uh, just before COVID started. We have an amazing. We had an amazing meeting in Barranquilla with one of our masters, our mentors, Dr. Scaff, in the upper left corner, and we did something based on the constructivism theory and how what, how we learn. Right. We had six stations, as you can see there. We had almost forty students with from all ages. And we learn it by doing with artificial eyes, with the real machines, with amazing mentors. So I think uh, we, this is a spread you know, all over the world. And you know, you guys can learn in a very efficient way. There is not only room for virtual simulation, but uh, simulation with artificial eyes. They're get, getting better and and you know more similar to the human eyes. Next one, please. Ivo, can you quote for the audience the study from England about how much it saved oh, the government? Sure, uh, and you read my mind uh, and it's coming. I wanted to show okay, this. And, no, 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 don't worry, don't worry. Uh, I wanted to share, to share this, uh, that it's the ecosystem we see. Imagine this, guys. Imagine trying, uh, you know, training with a virtual simulation with the colleagues next to you, with a mentor, uh, you know, uh, walking around and giving you tips with a screen, as you can see there, with how you, the vectors move, behave in, in a capsule of braces. I think everything is coming and you're going to have a lot of tools to to the next one to learn. And Guillermo was talking about this. This is a very important research from a great friend, Dr. John Ferris from the UK. And go go fast here and you're going to tell you, look at, look at the numbers, 265 surgeons in six years of follow-up with 17,000 procedures, and they did a 38% reduction in posterior capsule breaks. And we did a podcast to Dr. John Ferris, you can hear it in Ophthalmocast, and he was talking about that he saved, I don't remember the number, but it was so much money for government, you know? So by do, do, using uh, artificial um, virtual simulation, you, you not only learn fast, but it's safer for the patients and better for the healthcare system. Next one. This, this is how you can see in those six years from 2009 to 2014, and the PCO rates came down. And the last one, this guy said it. we had an amazing panel, but I'm, I'm there drinking my mate and enjoying what I love the most, and is to have that virtual simulator 
surrounded by cameras and you can see next one we did uh many many episodes you know people from the states as you can see there john ferry was, was number one jeff Pitti from the u.s bruna ventura from brazil florian kretz from uh, germany uh, susan jacob from india what i mean is there is a lot of content out there for you guys to learn next one and a new way of doing things. Yeah, we had the chance to see the great Elon Musk, you know, shipping a, a, a rocket uh, to, to space. So I think there's a new way of doing things. Next one. And just to finish, uh, I think this is a very important thing. Uh, and I will love the panel again very, very fast to tell us what to do next. Because then, okay, we have virtual simulation. Okay, we have artificial eyes. Okay, we have mentors. But then we need to go to the patients. And there is a couple of keys to your first surgeries. What will be, Guillermo, your two or three tips for somebody who's going to do their first surgery in a human being? I mean, I think, I think I'll repeat my comment. I mean, you have to be prepared and you have to control what you can. Uh, so the more you control, the better you're gonna do it. Uh, you have you have to pick a mentor, uh, and the mentor needs to be involved. Uh, and why not? Like the uh, you, the patient also be it needs to be involved that there you know there is a, a, a teaching hospital. So a good informed consent uh, also helps. So that way you decrease the stress level in the OR. Thank you, Ishtiake. Yeah, be relaxed and. Uh... Have your mentor beside you. Thank you very much. May? Hi. Uh, yes, I think uh, pre-op pre preparation is very important. So you need to uh, see the patient carefully uh, to exclude the dry eye, something like that, and treat them first, and then calculate the eye will power, choose the right power, and choose the uh, one side and uh, keep your mentor beside you while you are doing operation. Thank you very much. Therese? Well, like what I said a while ago, um, basic knowledge, muscle memory, they create purposeful movements that will, make your, that will make your surgeries fast and efficient without you really trying too much. So that's it. Thank you very much. Diego? I think in your first FACO, um, the most important is the mentor that you are going to have next to you. So you are going to have problems. So you need a good surgeon next to you. You're lucky you have it right there next to you in the screen. <laughs> yeah, I know. You, bet, you better say yes. <laughs> Karen? I agree with everything else. And the only other thing I would add is to um, to get to know the patient well and, and to have a relationship with them because that can make a big difference, um, especially if something were to go wrong. Um, they know that you're there to fix it and that you'll see them through it until everything is okay. Amazing, amazing. Yeah, very good one. Thank you. Christos? Yeah, the, the preparation is so key. I think that uh, no, no matter how skilled you are, you should always be thinking three steps ahead and think out every uh, possibility, just like a good military general too, right? So I even, for my complex cases, I have my iPad. I actually draw out every single step on really complex cases before I do it. And it builds confidence. I do it again and again until I think, okay, if this happens, then I know what I'm going to do. So that way, when I get into the OR, I know everything that could possibly happen or close to it. You're always going to have those surprises, but at least you know what you're going to do because you've thought about it. And the anxiety level goes down to zero when you know what you're going to do. And then from the mentorship perspective, I think everybody's got different personalities and you need to jive uh, and get along with your mentor really well. For me, I think the most important thing is there's a lot of good surgeons out there, but a good surgeon doesn't make a good teacher. Uh, and so you want somebody who's humble. You know, there's plenty of surgeons who think they're the best thing that's ever happened to the world. Uh, you don't want that one teaching you. You want a person who wants you to be better than they were. So find the person who, when they're done operating at the end of their career, they leave knowing that they've trained surgeons that will be better than they were. Wow. 
I am speechless. I think you, you cannot say that better, you know, to find somebody who wants you to be better than them. I think that's so powerful, Christos. Thank you so much. Again, guys, uh, this QR is the one, you know, if you have any questions, you can take a picture and we will be there for you. And also just to finish, I want to thank Jorge Hernandez, who is out there, you know, another surgeon, because this is such an amazing community. We're here, or here sharing our time. And Jorge is an amazing surgeon and gives his time to us, you know, to translate to Spanish to people who don't understand English so well. So Jorge, as always, thank you so much. May, uh, so, 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 so happy to have you. Charisse as well, you know, so far away, but now I feel you guys so close to us. It's, it's from Bangladesh, but he's a brother already. So, you know, we feel so close. Uh, Karen and Christos, thank you so much for your time as well. Amazing concepts. And Diego, good luck in that uh, learning curve with the amazing Guillermo Mezcual, who is a, an inspiration to all the ophthalmologists in Latin America for his quality and also for his, you know, he wants to share knowledge all the time. So we're so happy to have you, Guillermo, again. Uh, yeah. Thanks, everybody. And I would love to have you again in the future, maybe a couple of weeks and I have another one with all of you we had, we had a great time i think people are very happy for all the comments so have a great night uh, the guys from this part of the world a great day to May, Charisse and Ishtiake and be in touch okay take care everybody thank you for hey, that bye have Take a good care. night everyone